Good evening. I am Brooke Clement, Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our final program centered around our current temporary exhibit, Women in Uniform. Women in Uniform showcases rarely displayed art from the Naval Heritage Command's collection. The selected works highlight the continuous and growing presence of women in the U.S. Navy throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. Women in Uniform is on display at the museum in Grand Rapids until May 6th. Tickets are available online and at the door. Tonight, we will hear the personal experiences of three area women who served in the U.S. military. Joel Westfall, the de Deputy Director of the Ford Library and Museum, will introduce our panel of, panel of speakers. Joel. Thank you, Brooke. Tonight's panel includes some very impressive Michigan service women. I'd like to thank Margaret Howard of Heather Hills, who we've partnered on many times before, for her help connecting with us on our panelists. Please join me in welcoming three panelists. The first is Colonel Bridget Brosna. Dr. Bridget Brosna retired as a colonel from the United States Air Force after 30 years of service. Some of her key leadership positions include acting mobilization assistant to the commander at the Air Force Research Laboratory and senior individual mobility augmentee to the commander of the Human Performance Wing. Next on our panel, we have Major Lorena Black. Major Black currently is serving in the Army Reserves and has 25 years with the Army, 21 years of active duty. She served in Germany, Kuwait, South Korea, and various stateside assignments. She was deployed to Kuwait during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Also with us on our virtual stage tonight is Sergeant Sarah Anderson, US Marine Corps. Ms. Anderson served in the Marine Corps as a public affairs specialist for nearly eight years. During her time, she worked as a correspondent, public affairs and photographer and writer, where she documented the Marine Corps story. She recently graduated from Grand Valley State University with a bachelor's in public relations and photography and is now working with the veterans of foreign wars Department of Michigan as a public relations consultant. To start the program, I'd like each to invite each of our panelists to share their experiences while serving. After, I will return on the screen to ask a few questions myself, followed by your questions from the audience. So please use that Q&A box at any time during the program to ask your questions. Bridget, start us off. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very thrilled and honored to have been asked to be part of this panel. My military career started out as an Air Force ROTC cadet. I went to the University of Maine and graduated after four years of ROTC. Um, went into active duty for five years and was a nurse um, for the, those five years at Andrews Air Force Base. After my five years, I decided to um, join the Air Force Reserves as an individual mobility augmentee. And that's different than an Air Force Reservist per se, because I worked for the active duty versus the um, reserve unit. And that afforded me a lot of opportunity as I advanced in rank and a lot of really cool jobs came my way. So my first assignment as an IMA was in an outpatient family practice clinic at the 66th Med Group at Cancer Air Force Base. I worked there for probably 10 years, 12 years, and advanced to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. As I was serving um, during that time, we um, went to war and the whole way in which the nurse corps was being managed changed and the way in which IMA positions changed. So at that point, I had a decision to, I was hitting my 20 year mark um, to either retire at 20 years or look for other opportunity. And I got a call from the Air Force Surgeon General's office and a, a colonel named Colonel Buckles called me out of the blue and asked if I wanted to join the Air Force Surgeon General's team um, as a nurse consultant. Um, I had graduated with my family nurse practitioner degree at that point, had my master's and went there to really serve in a role to help the nurse corps develop policies and look at how the whole Air Force Medical Service was um, being 
was formed and run. So that was a really cool job. But very shortly after arriving, I was told our Air Force Surgeon General, General Green at the time, um, wanted to ensure that any member of his team was not only willing to deploy, but have de had deployed on his team. And my response was, I had not deployed yet, but I'm willing to if I'm ever tasked. Within a very short time, I deployed to Afghanistan as the um, Contingency Air Medical Staging Facility Commander. And that was one of the pinnacle points of my career. I absolutely loved the six months I got to um, serve in Afghanistan and do the job that I was trained to do um, for 20 plus years. Um, much to the chagrin of my husband who was left at home with three children, um, which, you know, again, I pretty much very appreciate everything that he did and my children did to sacrifice my, while I was there. Um, when I returned from Afghanistan, I really had a change in what I wanted to do in my both my civilian career as well as my Air Force career. Um, I, when I got back, was selected as a, um, for colonel and at that point had to find a job that was, you know, aligned with my rank. So that's when I ended up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base as the IMA to the first, the Dean of the um, United States Air Force um, School of Aerospace Studies, and then was promoted into the IMA to the 7-11th Human Performance Wing, um, or the IMA to the commander. And then while I was there, um, the MA position became available and they were looking for a new person. So I got to serve um, for that commander. It was a phenomenal um, time, the 30 years. Everything that I got to do, whether female or male, were um, opportunities that I was able to provide the service that I was called to do. Um, and as a nurse, I was able to care for the, the wounded um, while I was in Afghanistan, which again was the reason I had joined to begin with. So the 30 years went by really quickly. Um, I was you know, asked if I wanted to stay in a little longer, but as a colonel, knowing that the rank, um, as you get higher in rank, there's only so many positions, it was the right time to pass the baton. I absolutely miss it every day, but I also know that the Air Force Nurse Corps has been in great hands. Um, and I, I'm very excited to see the way in which the military has gone and allowing women to um, compete for and or um, promote into positions of um, combat versus non-combat, which was not available to me when I first joined. So with that, I will turn it back over to Joel. Thank you very much, Joel. Hi, everyone. I'm not Joel. <laughs> oh, sorry, Laura. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I, they, <laughs> I think we were thinking Joel was going to come back, but my name is Lorena Black. Um, I joined the Army in 1997. I was 18 years old. Um, I joined at a time when I, I never thought, no one in my family thought that I would serve in the military, um, but it was something that intrigued me about it, and it was something that I, I couldn't quit, and so off I went. Um, I was a private when I joined, and I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for my um, basic training in AIT, and I came out as a, an, an admin, admin soldier. The, the MOS has changed over the years, but I was um, an admin soldier up until 2009 when I put in a um, green to gold packet. At that point, I had already worked my way up from private to sergeant first class. Um, I'd had two daughters and I decided to go ahead and um, put in this green to gold packet. I needed a waiver for everything. I was already too old. I'd already been in too long and I had, was married to another service member. But I was accepted into the program, and so I spent two years doing ROTC on the active duty option program, and then I earned my commission and my bachelor's degree, and I commissioned into the Signal Corps. From there, I went um, to South Korea with my four-year-old and my five-year-old daughter, and um, it was a pretty, pretty challenging as a brand new second lieutenant with two children and then uh, my ex-husband and I ended, went through a divorce. So I was also a single mom. I remember being there. I remember getting alerted before you know daycare opened and being in my office with my rucksack, my rifle and my four-year-old on my lap. Um, I remember <laughs> you could time your watch to um, 1755 every day. You'd see me running from my office across the street to the daycare before they closed getting my girls, bringing them back to the office with me. Um, but I had a really great time. That was probably 
my favorite time in the military. I was a platoon leader of a um, an expedition in an expeditionary signal battalion, and I had about 50 soldiers that fell under me, and we were responsible for providing signal support to different units um, through South Korea, and it just it was just it was a really great time. After I left Korea, I went um, to Fort Hood, Texas, and it was funny because the unit was slotted to go to Afghanistan, but it changed. And as soon as I got to Fort Hood, I was told I was going to South Korea. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not going to South Korea. I just got back from two years in Korea, but I was wrong. So after a year, I was in a cab unit. So after a year of gunneries and NTC and the field, I found myself back in Korea again, this time without my two girls. Um, but again, it was a really good time. I went ahead and took advantage of that time and I started working on my master's degree. So by the time I got back to the States and finished up my captain's career course, I was able to you know, walk away with that degree. So that was really good. After I came back from Korea, I left Fort Hood. I took uh, an observer coach trainer position at Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And at that point I was going TDY a lot. I had met and got remarried to my, to my current husband, but we were living separate because he also had two small children. So I had to make a choice and I chose, I was gonna go ahead and retire. I was at 21 years at that point, but I knew I needed to, I was ready to have my, my daughter stable. So I uh, started, I got the paperwork ready. I put it in my packet, but then I learned that I could ETS from active duty, go into the reserves and then still continue on my time to where I could actually retire as an officer. So that's what I did in 2018. I left active duty and I joined um, a reserve unit here in Michigan. And for the last four years, I've been serving in the reserves. And as it turns out, I was just selected this last year for my promotion to major. And this coming Saturday on April 30th, I will officially be retired from the army after 25 years, couple months, couple days. Um, but it's been a really great experience for me. It hasn't always been fun. I've had some pretty crappy times, but overall, um, I tell young people all the time, it, it changed my life. I, I don't know that I would be where I am right now, doing what I'm doing right now, um, leading the way I lead right now, had I not joined the army. When I was that 18 year old kid, I was a wallflower. I was a follower. Um, like I said, I had a cousin who said, Lorena can't join the army. She's too nice to be in the army. But here I am. It's been just just a, a wonderful time. I know it was mentioned before. I I deployed. Um, I was actually, if I think back to September 11th, I was stationed in Germany at the time. No kids. I was a um, Sergeant E5, and I remember when when September 11th happened, and it was such a scary time. I remember patrolling the the base with my 249, which was a pretty heavy weapon and I just, it was, it was just such a scary time. And then my unit um, deployed to, I was in the brigade S1. So we stayed in Kuwait while our other units pushed forward into, into Iraq. And it, you just, we just did what we had to do. And then I think about all of the friends I've had that have deployed so many times with young children. And I've been pretty blessed and lucky to only have to leave my girls you know, one time for a long deployment and then just, you know, short times throughout. But again, this, um, this life that the army has given me has been fantastic. So with that, I will hand it over to probably Sarah. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for having me. It's really an honor to, uh, share with you all and be on a platform with these powerful women who have been in the military much longer than I was. Um, I was in the Marine Corps for nearly eight years. I got to the rank of Sergeant. Um, I enlisted back in 2009. Um, shortly after high school, um, I was just a very active student and I wasn't really ready to sit in another classroom just yet. I wanted to stay active and um, my brother had just joined the Marines and that piqued my interest. I went to a recruiter and so many people told me that that was the hardest branch. So I don't know if that's the one for you. And I said, send it, let's go, let's try this out. And you now I shipped off to boot camp, got stationed in 29 Palms. Um, my, my job was public affairs, which is translated into public relations. Um, 
on the government side. And I work closely with combat cameras, so I was a photographer as well. Um, I worked in multiple newspapers and wrote stories. Basically, my job was to tell the Marines story. Um, in 29 Palms, California, it was a desert warfare training area. So we would, before every deployment to Afghanistan, um, all the units would come through for pre-deployment training. Um, I'd be, had the opportunity to train with them and take their photos and learn more about desert warfare and the culture that they were going into. Um, also, that's where I fell in love with photography. Um, I was able to document a lot of stories, um, a lot of heartbreaking and sad stories as well as naturally comes with war. Um, but those stories and those photos really impacted me and to looking at moments and photography in a totally different way. Um, after my first enlistment, I went to Hawaii where I had the opportunity to train with countries and militaries all over the Pacific, partnered and allied nations. Um, and I learned so much about the world if I, I grew up in West Michigan, so and I love this area, um, but I had no idea what was out there when I left. Um, and, you know, I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I loved being a Marine. Uh, as a female, I joined 6% of the force at the time. Now I believe it's up to 10%, um, but we were a very small percentage of the overall Marine Corps. And it was a very intense lifestyle to live, um, which I absolutely loved and embraced and all of us did. Uh, but once you get out and you're able to step back and like look at some perspective, you can just see just how different life was. Um, it was a warrior culture and leaving um, the struggle with transitioning out was I think evident of a culture clash between um, not just the civilian society, but it's just the going from a warrior culture and a team mindset to blazing a trail on your own was kind of a struggle. And I've kind of seen that with other veterans as they're getting out. But I, I love talking to other female veterans. And I, I like I said, this is a really cool platform to talk about it. Um, it's, it's like a juxtaposition, I feel because when I was in, we tried so hard to just be like part of the team, one of the guys, and it didn't feel like we were singled out at all. And to get out and now speak about your experience as a female specifically is just like new, really. Um, a Marine's a Marine in everyone's eyes. And, um, but we all do have different backgrounds, different cultures, different um, perspectives. And I, I love that we're able to share that here. Um, when I was stationed in Hawaii, I was able to deploy to Australia um, a few times, actually, um, some for short stints, some for longer, but I was able to work closely with the Australian military and um, learned a lot about our partner nations and regional security in the Pacific, if you will. Um, and I'm just really grateful for my experience. Um, when, I, when I left the military, I went to Grand Valley and I, like I said, it was a struggle transitioning out, um, out, out of active duty. Um, and I just joined the veterans club at the school. And honestly, that really, really helped. Um, just finding like-minded individuals from all different backgrounds, all different branches, um, but we all understood. And that was, that was really awesome. So I was able to help out with that club at Grand Valley. And now I'm working at the VFW, still working with veterans and advocating for um, legislation and just a uh, community where we all can come together and just feel at home again. Um, but that is kind of me in a nutshell. I will pass it along to Joel from there. Okay, well, I have, wait, I'll wait for Lauren to bring everybody on so we can have the whole panel. And then I have some questions for all of you. So my first question, and we can go in order. So after I ask the question, we can kind of go in the same order. Um, I actually had this question prepared and then it seems that one of our attendees tonight asked the same question. So this question not only comes from me, this question comes from anonymous attendee, um, which is, is this, what, what was the hardest experience faced by each of you, the best and the most memorable? 
So I guess I'm just, okay. So um, I think the hardest experience for me was while I was deployed to Afghanistan, um, I, I got to the end of my deployment and I was supposed to be going home. And um, I, um, the person who was taking over my spot got there and was not medically qualified to stay. So I got called into the commander's office and was asked if I would be willing to stay for six to eight more weeks while they found someone else, got them spun up and sent them over. And as any good officer, of course, my answer was, well, you know, yes, except that as a reservist, uh, my answer was, let me check with my husband. <laughs> so um, I called my husband and that's when I found out that my son um, had started experiencing some significant medical issues um, back in October. And this is now like the end of December um, as a result of a time when I was on the phone with my family and having just a normal conversation and then our um, base started getting rocketed. And when the rockets start coming in, you hear sirens going off and, you know, I was medical, so I was close to the hospital, um, but, you know, you have to report and wait and see if there's wounded. So I had to hang up and just say, you know, I'll call you back. And that particular night, it, we were rocketed all night long. So I was not able to call home until the very next day. And as a result, my son, who was 11 at the time, had started having nightmares, started throwing up, and literally was just every time he ate, would get sick. So my husband was dealing with that secretly while I was deployed because he didn't want me to have that, that weight on me while I was um, over there. When I found that out, that was the hardest thing that you know I had to, to you know, carry with me. And we've had conversations even now, he's 23, and he still remembers how hard that was. He was very afraid that his mom was going to war, even though as a non-combatant, um, I, I tried to assure him I was going to be safe. And then he asked me, well, why are you where, where, why do you carry a weapon? Because all of us carried a weapon. So that was really tough as a mom um, to have to go through that, but also as a military officer. Um, and again, reflecting back, I don't think I would change anything except understand and, and want you know, the world to understand that when anyone deploys, whether it's a mom or a dad and they're leaving children behind, that's an impact on the family. And we need, I think as a, um, as a uh, United States, give more empathy and more support to the family members. Cause I really think that they carry as much of a burden or more because when you're deployed and you're facing and you're focused on your job, that's all you have to do. It's actually, I think, a little easier because you don't have to worry about running to soccer and getting the kids to the doctors, et cetera. So I think that was the toughest. Um, the most rewarding, what was the two other things? It was most rewarding and most what? Um, the most rewarding and uh, the, uh, the, the best and the most memorable. Okay. So the, the best experience, I think, was as, a, as I advanced in rank, I was... Um, able to work on the board of um, directors for the nurse corps and sit on the development team um, for the, the whole nurse corps. And you're able to help mentor and um, develop junior officers and really be able, what, what we call kind of put them into the right jobs. Um, and so I think that was part of the best part that I got to do is mentor and help develop future officers and future nurses. Um, my most memorable are, you know, caring for the Marines that we had. Um, they're a whole other, whole other brand of, of military. Um, you know, most of our patients were Marines and I was taken aback by their core commitment to who they were, their core identity and not wanting to leave anyone behind. And, you know, as a, as an Air Force officer, I, I, I seriously was like, okay, I'm not in Kansas anymore. These Marines are the real deal, if you will. I was, it was pretty phenomenal to watch. Um, but I do have a cute story when um, the two Marines, they were um, both wounded going home. And I was doing basically the, the bus nurse. I was the nurse waiting for all of our outbound patients to be loaded and to be brought to the airplane to go home. And um, there was we load, load litters one on top of the other. So the top litter is loaded, the lo lower litter um, patient is being loaded and is done. Well, the top patient can't see who's on the bottom. So this Marine on the top said, hey, who's down there? And the Marine on the bottom says, you know, his name. And, he said, and he's like, oh, oh, you won't believe what happened today. He said, what happened? And he said, 
I turned 21. And they're like, wow, man, happy birthday. He goes, no, no, that's not it. He said, the nurses and the medical surgical unit for me before I left made me an, um, a birthday cake with their easy bake oven to, to thank me to say, to say happy birthday. That was just sweet because as nurses, we did what we could to make them as comfortable as possible. But, you know, I could tell multiple stories like that. But seeing that and, and seeing what we, we did, what we could to make a difference, even in a small way, um, I saw every day in Afghanistan. And I was very proud of um, coming home with, you know, every member of our, our unit. Uh, thank you, Bridget. Mm -hmm. Lorena, same questions to you. Same question to you, please. Sure. I have, um, when I think about difficult times, I have, I have two actually that I'd like to share. One was when I was pregnant with my first, no, sorry, my first daughter was seven months old and I was pregnant, found out I was pregnant with my second daughter a week after their father deployed to Iraq. Um, and so that was my first taste of being a single mom. And I, I worked for um, a first sergeant that was, was, a, was a mom herself, but she'd always had a really good support system. So she didn't really understand uh, or didn't have a lot of um, sympathy for you women who couldn't figure it out. And so my daughter, was, my seven month old was getting sick a lot. And my, um, I was basically told, you know, I don't care if you're your kid is sick or not, figure it out. Um, get to work kind of thing. And so I made a really tough decision. And I said, you know, I, don't, I can't be a good soldier and a good mom. And I was at this point, I was 10 years in the military. I was a staff sergeant. I was like, I'm just, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. And with their dad deployed, it was just a really tough time. So I, I, I was going to get out. Um, luckily, none of that worked out in my favor. And I didn't get out. <laughs> um, but that, that was, that was a hard, a hard period, just trying to figure out how to be a mom and a soldier and, and, it, and it just, it was tough. Um, but fast forward, got past that, got commissioned. And I was at, in that CAV unit I mentioned at Fort Hood and I was working for an infantry officer and I was new in the, in the signal field. And I had, um, I was our, our, our battalion S6, which meant I was over all of the commo in, in our battalion. And I had about maybe 10, 10 soldiers that worked for me. But it was a situation where, um, where I, I just, I couldn't do any, anything right in the eyes of my, um, our battalion XO. And he, his leadership style was one of um, yelling and screaming and throwing things and swearing at me. And, and this went on for, for two years through the deployment to a point where I was physically making myself sick physically. And then I finally had to, um, I was, I think maybe my upbringing as a private, you, you just, yes, sir, you know, kept moving. And I, and I, and I did my best with that, but it, it was a really challenging time to constantly be berated like that. Um, and it, it just got to a point where I finally, finally got up the, I guess the nerve to let him know his leadership style wasn't working for me. And I was, to he told me, oh, I'm really sorry, Lorena. I'm just not good working with females. And um, and then <laughs> <laughs> that stopped for a couple of weeks and then he went right back to it. And it just um it just finally got so bad where I just couldn't I couldn't take it anymore. I tried. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to rock the boat and I didn't want to, you know, <sighs> all those things, but I learned a valuable lesson for him from it. Won't ever let anybody treat me like that again. So there is a, you know. A good story there. Um, my most memorable it was when I was um, probably when I was a an NCO. Again, I went through um, the process to be inducted into the Sergeant Audie Murphy Club, which is a pretty um, prestigious club that NCOs get inducted into, and you have to go through a whole board process. And so I I, I went through that and got inducted into into that club. So that was a really really cool experience just everything I went through you know to that board the challenge just all of it so that was awesome and then um again just my time in Korea with with my platoon like I just love all of my soldiers I love any time a soldier would get out and they tell you how you impacted them or how you made a difference in their lives or or what you did I that that 
that doesn't get old. Like I, th that will always be just my favorite part of being in the military. And I have to say when my daughters know that they need to stand up, like, you know, and so they'll, they'll salute sometimes when the national anthem plays, <laughs> just things like that, just seeing, you know, just the impact that I've had on other people. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, same questions to you. Um, well, the military is very bittersweet. There is a lot of problems, but there's also a lot of things that you will never ever experience anywhere else. Um, like there's going to be poor leadership everywhere you go, but there's also going to be great leadership. And I think, um, like as these two women can attest that there's, there's good and bad leadership you'll run across. It's kind of, um, it's a growing moment for sure. I think the biggest struggle for me coming from uh, just a private school in West Michigan was an introduction to sexism for my the, for the first time in my life. And um, that it, it was very it was very difficult, I think, to wrap my mind around that people looked at me differently just because I was a female. It just didn't didn't compute for a long time. Um, and that was hard because, you know, I, I was a Marine, worked just as hard, made the same standards everything ran the same courses but it still wasn't the same and it felt like I was working as hard or m more hard to get some recognition not even equal and I'm not trying to say that as like as an overall thing it was just at the time I was in it was very difficult and at the time I was in women weren't allowed in combat roles yet so there was there kind of like the stigma of a little bit lesser and then I was also in when that was repealed. So the debates and the arguments and the, you know, can women actually meet the standards? And turns out they can, <laughs> but just a lot of people just wouldn't let go of that old mindset, the old way of thinking. Um, man, I, I knew some really strong female Marines when I was in that just would put so many males, just run circles around them. And it's just like nothing they could do would you know, could show that they were, you know, it was very, it was a struggle. And I think I'm hoping it's gotten better over time. Um, I, it took me a while to just kind of reason with that, that, you know, I, I did everything I could. Um, but I think that that was like a culture thing. Um, but also conversely, the best thing about that, uh, about the military for me was um, the camaraderie that you did find with the other Marines. I mean, the Marine Corps birthday every year we celebrate and we, the, the Marine Corps is a branch, is a very proud branch. Um, and we all know our history where it's nailed into our head from day one in boot camp. Um, we are, we have warrior mindsets and it was just really awesome just to be around a group of each other. It's always great to be around other veterans, but when you're around specifically your people, it is just something something else. Um, I remember one time in my unit, we had a, a mess night, which is like a tradition in the Marines. If you go out to the field, do a hike or a PT session in your um, camis and, you know, you uh, have the commanders out there and it's, there's just like a big mess night. It's a tradition of a dinner and there's jokes and there's, you know, a, a sketches and stuff. And um, I just remember at the end of the night, there was this big bonfire and then all all the Marines were out there just hanging out and talking story and sharing um, sea stories and, you know, deployment stories. And it was just, I just remember standing there thinking like, I don't think I'll ever see this anywhere else. And it was just like a moment of real, um, real awe for me that like, this is my family. Um, and I, I miss it very much. Um, one of the coolest things when you ask, like one of the coolest experiences I had um, as a photographer, I was super lucky and was able to hop from unit to unit all the time. One week I'd be with artillery, the next week I'd be with um, air wing, flying helicopters, and then another week I'd be out with the grunts, and another week I'd be, you know, just here and there at the, at the pool, like um, doing swim qualifications and all over. And one, a uh, few field exercises, I was with the tankers. And first tank battalion, at the time, the Marines had tanks, they don't anymore but there was only two or three battalions in the whole branch. And uh, first tanks, I went out with them and I, I got to know how close and unique that community was of tankers. Um, and a few times they really liked my photos and they reached out to my command and offered me and my Lieutenant to 
shoot the tank. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I don't know if any female has shot a tank before, but I unofficially like loaded around and shot a tank, which is really cool. Um, because I don't, that, that's not a very common thing since the whole unit's so small. So to me, that was a huge honor that they just liked my photos and appreciated uh, me being part of their storytelling that they allowed me to uh, take a few rides in the tank and, and shoot it. So I got to BZO the, the target. <laughs> okay, my, my next question, and it's gonna be to each of you kind of individually, but I'm gonna start off with the Mustang in the group. So for those of you who do not know what a Mustang is, um, Major Black is a Mustang. Major Black started out as a enlisted and then became uh, an officer. I'm a huge fan of Mustangs because the best leader I ever worked for when I was in the DOT, DOD was a Mustang. He was an Air Force Colonel and we're still friends and I'm a huge fan of Mustangs. Um, and the question I have for you, um, Lorena, is what were the challenges of leadership that going from enlisted to officer were, were, were things different as a as a woman as a female were things different did you notice kind of a, a change uh, as kind of a lead as a leader and i'm specifically talking about leadership here because we've got three leaders on this panel we have a colonel a major and an nco all of all leaders in different respects so that's kind of my question for you lorena was was there differences yeah well and it was in, an interesting difference for me because I went from being working in an administrative office in an S1 with a couple of soldiers where we we were responsible for all the paperwork to going to an actual line unit. So I think, I mean, that in itself was very different. The leadership was different because it's, I had, as a platoon leader, I had a platoon sergeant, I had squad leaders, I had you know, the soldiers were in an S1, you're the one officer and you've got a couple, mostly NCOs working for you. Um, one thing, when I got to Korea as a second lieutenant, people in the, my unit already knew, they knew my ex-husband and they knew that I was an NCO. So when I got there, all of the stuff that they would normally haze a second lieutenant with, nobody, nobody really did that to me because they knew my background. Um, I think the biggest thing that I noticed about my leadership style as an officer is I was really hard on my, my NCOs because I had been an NCO and I felt that our, our young soldiers, like they were responsible for our young soldiers. So I was very hard on my NCOs because you're, you're the reason that somebody may stay in, may get out, may, may live sometimes. So I, I very much probably was a little more like an NCO than an officer <laughs> at first. And I, I remember a soldier one time came to me and they asked me if I could, could I sit in on the meetings that our platoon sergeant did with the first sergeant because I was the one with, sorry, this is vulgar, but I was the one with the balls in our platoon. <laughs> so could I please, you know, do that? And so I, I definitely um, feel like my leadership style did fit more on the officer side because I do remember as a as an NCO where people have an expectation that as a as an NCO is you know it's the knife hand and you have to be stern and you have to be hard all the time and that just isn't my natural personality and when you're an officer people don't I expect it so you, I, I I guess I felt a little freer to be more of my natural self if that makes sense in my in the way I led. Thank you, Lorena. And again, I'm a big fan of Mustangs. My next question is for Sarah. So Sarah, you already kind of touched upon this already with the fact that the Marine Corps is a very male dominated organization. Um, and you were a leader uh, at the NCO level in, in the Marine Corps. Um, were, there, were there challenges being a female in a leadership position at that NCO kind of level um, that you had to deal with? Was there, were there, were there, were there simply male corporals who simply, I'm not gonna listen to you, you're a, you're a woman and that's just that? Um, I would say in my immediate unit, no. Um, there is a level of discipline um, and self-discipline. Um, you can usually weed out um, the strength of a leader just based on their, um, the effort they put into their unit. 
Um, so, I mean, to me, I took a lot of pride in leading Marines. That was one of my favorite parts of being a Marine was taking care of my juniors. Um, part of our creed is leading the young and influencing the old, that our job never stops, that we, um, we have a responsibility to both sides of the spectrum of leaders and young leaders and um, older ones. Um, so I, I, I loved that part about being an NCO, and I love that part about being a Marine. Um, I would say my job as a photographer, because I hopped between different units a lot, I often was in units that didn't have females. Some of them never saw females. Um, some of them had just like seen them at a distance going through the admin building and just saw this unicorn and wondered what it was until I showed up into the field and they're like, she's got long hair. And it was, it was, um, <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it was kind of funny. Sometimes it was like endearing, like, okay, I'm not scary guys. And the, but sometimes there was um, situations of disrespect and that's when I had to uh, stand up as a sergeant and um, like Lauren, I said, I'm not one to yell and knife hand, but I am one to not back down. So it, that, that, that was kind of also important in the role and as uncomfortable and hard as it was sometimes, honestly, um, I, if I didn't stand up, then the next female would be targeted or the next female would not be, um, looked at as an equal. And that to me was unacceptable. Um, and so, yeah, there were some situations, um, but I would say most of the time it was worked out. I always had backup with my unit, um, my my juniors and my peers in my um, photo team and public affairs team were always really awesome. We always had each other's back and it was a very close, like small media team, if you will. But um, yeah, there were some challenges there, but it's important to say something. You can't just be passive in a role like that um, because it's not just Sarah Anderson that's going to be you know pushed aside. It's going to be your females that are coming after you. And it's it, it, it's a level of responsibility, I think, for an NCO to take. So Bridget, my, my question for you about, about leadership is, is this. So um, the, the climb from 01 to 06 is a steep one. Um, and there, have to, there had to have been a lot of, uh, um, or perhaps there wasn't, um, challenges along the way, being a female and making that climb from 01 all the way to 06. What was the biggest challenge that you had um, with on that on that climb? Um, so as you're advancing in rank, you you know in the nurse corps especially, um, and this you pretty much get promoted for from first lieutenant or second lieutenant to first lieutenant as long as you didn't break any laws or kill anyone you're, you're, it's pretty automatic same thing about captains even though there's a little bit more weeding when you get to major it gets a little bit more competitive so I think one of the big things that I would say is understanding early on where you want to go and you have to have that you know, manage your career or it's not, it's not going to happen. So I had a very early on vision and goal that I wanted to retire as a colonel. And um, I did a lot of research on what would that look like and what kind of opportunities and what did I need to do to make myself um, competitive and successful. And so in the military, just like in the civilian world, but much more in the military, you're competing for slots. Um, and as you advance in rank, those slots get less and less and less. And so you have to, you know, have, have that, um, you know, you don't want to be the person that failed a PT test. You don't want to be the person that didn't, you know, complete your annual training and all the things that you had to do just to get on, you know, get your folder accepted into that role. But you also had professional military education you had to complete for each military um, rank. And it's equivalent to a master's degree that you're doing as a correspondence with a reservist while you're working full time, while you're being a reservist and you're running a household and with three kids. Um, so that was very challenging. And when I got to Air War College, um, I was a, trained as a line officer as an ROTC, but at, at Air War College, it was a whole other spectrum because it was basically learning how to run a squadron in a combat environment that I knew I was never gonna have to apply, but it was part of that checkbox, if you will. Um, and also while you're doing that, um, they want you to have a national certification to whatever your specialty is in, and then also get a master's degree and 
Um, with nursing now, it's, you know, they're, they're really pushing for at least a doctorate um, or getting your DMP, which is what I did recently with OSU. Um, so that was very challenging. And ultimately, you know, I had great support with my husband um, and my three children, but it's a lot of sacrifice and you're sacrificing time with your kids to be able to put the time in um, to be able to compete for those ad advancing ranks. It's, it does, it, it's not handed to you. Um, and then understanding that when you get promoted, the higher rank you go, really the more you have to, if you have to talk about your rank, it, it, you're doing something wrong. Um, I was afforded great mentors and um, understood that the more rank I was given, the more responsibility I had to you know, pay it forward and reach down and try to help. Those. So for every position I was in as a reservist, I was the senior reservist at Hanscom. I was a senior reservist at um, Wright-Patterson. And my main goal as the senior reservist is I would review everyone's professional records and help ensure that they understood what they needed to do, depending on what their professional goals were. If someone said, I want to retire as a major, um, I'd be, you know, I would explain to them, what does that mean? But really align folks so that they would be able to you know, put their best foot forward and have those conversations, those critical conversations in a timely way. Because um, for one example, we had a reservist who had been active duty for a while, got out at 11 years, and then stayed what he thought was inactive reserves, came back in, I think it was five years later, and thought he had two years before he was going to meet the Lieutenant Colonel Board. And, you know, I reviewed his record and I'm like, no, you're, re you're meeting the board this year based on his date of rank. And when he got out and how his and had I not done that, had I not had that conversation at the time, he would not have been promoted. And we, as his senior reservist, I worked with his active duty counterpart and was able to put him in positions and um, opportunities that he performed and he was able to successfully do. And ultimately he's now a Colonel in the Air Force Reserves. So that, that's what I think, you know, as you advance in rank, it's important that you, you understand the responsibility you have and, you know, paying it forward. Cause I would have loved to have had someone mentor me in that way early on I kind of learned it myself um, but yeah and I and I also think not having a supportive family unit would be very hard to be a successful officer in the military yeah the, mil the military the department of the, 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 the I should say the military I've never heard anybody in the military say you know I, I rose up the ladder and then I burned it after I climbed that's something you just never hear coming from anybody in the military. It, it just, that's why you see the kind of progression of success, whether you're male, female, it doesn't make a difference. You know, I've never heard anybody say that ever in, in, in the military. Um, my next question, and a lot of you touched upon this, is, is that of, of family uh, and the challenges uh, posed by family. But I wanna, I wanna ask this question more along the lines of, you're having a sit down um, with someone who is interested in becoming, uh, joining, joining the military. And you've had these challenges, you've, you've mentioned some of the challenges, um, each, all, each, each three of you. Um, what would you say to them about that when they ask, well, how do, I, how do I, if they ask a question similar along the lines of, okay, I'd like to go in, but I've got a boyfriend or I'm married. Um, how does that work? I mean, how does that work? So anything, comments about this, would be great. And um, Sarah, we'll start with you this time. Uh, I The first thing I thought of, uh, when when women come to me and they say they're thinking about the Marines, um, I usually tell them to pick a different branch. Um, and it's not because I don't love the Marines. I absolutely do. But it takes a very specific type of mental toughness to be a female in that environment. Um, I mean, lots of women do it. I did it. Um, I, it's more like, I just want to prepare them that it's not going to be an easy life. Um, I, while I was in, I was divorced as well. Um, I, it's hard to have relationships. It's, um, hard to keep up your professional life and personal life. Um, and I don't want to discourage any female from wanting to join the Marines. I just, want to encourage preparedness um, and because mental toughness is something that needs to be developed and there's no pressure. We all start at the beginning somewhere. Um, if you want it bad enough, you can make it, but you need to want it. And that's that's kind of where I go with. Um, but yeah, I 
I developed my family after leaving the service. Lorena? I am such a fan for the military just because, like I said, how the Army changed my life. I was raised by a single mom, didn't, it's just, it just changed it. But when I do talk to young people, I do, it, you, you, you make a choice. Like if you want to be a parent in the military, I mean, it's a choice and it is a tough choice because there are sacrifices. There's, there's give and take. Like I've missed, you know, things with my girls, um, kindergarten plays or this or that been, been gone. But I, I truly feel that the reward that I've gotten back has been so much greater. And even I tell my girls, like one of my daughter, my daughter's, my oldest is 15 now. And one of her friends is like, oh, I want to do ROTC. And my daughter's like, oh no, don't join the military. And it's because, you know, from her eyes, mom was always gone. They moved so much, you know, like, but I have to remind them the things that they were given, you know, living in Korea, you know, going to Hawaii, getting all this stuff. Um, I think as far as on the marriage front, it's just, I think maybe Bridget said it's just having like your partner has to be a partner and they have to support you. Um, and as, as long as you have that, that right partnership and again, back to Sarah, the preparedness, as long as you know, like you're, it's, it's, it's not easy, but, but if you want it bad enough, you can totally do it. Bridget. So I would say, you know, what, what the, two other panelists have said as well, but I would also um, say critical conversations early on is important. Um, my husband and I met in ROTC, so he kind of knew what he was getting himself into. Um, and then when I was in the military, active duty, you know, I ultimately, I had envisioned initially um, following his career and that was not something that he wanted anymore um, in the military. So. Um, when I got off active duty, it was because I wanted to be able to have that flexibility with my kids. Because as a mom, when my kids were ill, my husband was a great dad. He was a stay-at-home dad for the first few years um, when our kids were small. But when they were ill, they wanted mom. And I felt that that tug, and that's the reason why I left active duty. Um, but far as when, if someone were coming to me right now and saying, I want to do this, I would say absolutely, because it's 100% doable if you have those conversations early, and then you have those conversations at critical times. And, um, but also surround yourself with like-minded and community assistance. I can tell you that my daughters and my son had three or four moms when we lived in Maine when they were younger. Um, my husband um, moved to Shanghai, China for almost two years um, during the time when I was still in the reserves and having to leave for every couple of weeks. So I would you know, send my, my son to one house and my two, two daughters to different houses with food, you know, gift cards to the grocery store to buy groceries. I mean, you, you figure it out, but you need to surround yourself with people that, you know, understand it, accept it. And, and I found that through um, our church, our Catholic church, as well as our, the Catholic school, my, my kids attended. Um, but then one other thing is, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, um, after 9-11, um, I came home ready to pack my bags, thinking I'm going to get a call any day. I'm going to go. And this is, this is when the military, you know, is going to call all the troops up. And that call didn't come right away. And my husband came home and we had that conversation where he's like, okay, you, you've done enough. It's time to ta resign your commission. It's time to get out. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I was kind of shocked and a little bit taken aback that we were having this conversation, but he was truly scared to death that the reality of me going to war and him being left behind um, was there. He's like, you know, I know that you're, you're trained, but I just, I don't know if I could do this. And so we made the agreement at that point that I wouldn't call up and say, hey, take me, take me. But if I got tapped, I would go because I reminded him that that, first of all, military members don't run when we're at war. You, you, you answer the call, especially as a reservist. I was on active duty during Desert Storm and there was multiple reservists that got activated. I think every reservist got activated in, from here to Tim, Timbuktu and a lot of them went to Andrews Air Force Base. And I remember as a very young lieutenant, lieutenant colonels complaining to me that had they known that they could get activated, they probably wouldn't have stayed in. And the whole time I'm thinking, then what, what were you thinking you were doing every weekend or you know, one weekend a month training for what? 
So um, that was very important to me that he and I had that conversation and he was very supportive. And ultimately when I went to Afghanistan, um, he was there to drop me off and he was there to pick me up and, um, and we, you know, Skyped almost weekly as much as we could. Um, but I also had great, great friends and an employer at the time that was very supportive um, with me going and my, my staff was awesome. So I think that's really important is surrounding yourself with people that are gonna support you, your community, your, um, your spouse and your siblings, whoever that might be. My, my next question, um, and I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna use some military acronyms here. Um, is the difference between serving CONUS and serving OCONUS. For those who don't know what that means, that means serving in the United States and serving abroad. Now, Sarah, I'm not sure if you, act, you served abroad or not, but I'm gonna pose this question to all three of you nonetheless. So I know that Bridget, you talked about your service abroad. Lorena, you talked about your service abroad. Not every country is used to seeing a woman in a military uniform. Um, what were some of the maybe interesting looks that you got or issues that maybe popped up when you were overseas um, that you'd like to just kind of talk about or mention or just things that you, you noticed? Do you care who goes first? Go, go for it. I just kind of have a funny story. So this is when I was, a, um, I think I was a specialist and we went to Egypt for Bright Star um, exercise. And we, we got an opportunity to, to, a guide took us off into, into Cairo and let us go shopping and do stuff like that. And I was, I think I was still, so I might've been, a, maybe I was a private a PFC. I don't know. I was still very young and very naive and very, and our guide, um, we went to eat and I just was taking my food, my tray. We went, we went to a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Egypt, <laughs> but, but I grabbed my tray. And so I grabbed his tray just because he was done and I took it up. Well, I guess I signaled to him that I wanted to be married to him or something because the, all the way he, he tried to propose <laughs> to me. He, he asked me to be his like second wife. He was trying to buy me gifts and all of the male soldiers are laughing at me because like I should have known better, but I'm like, I did, I don't, I was, so that's probably a silly story, but it was just kind of funny because it was a cultural thing that I definitely, you know, got wrong there. And I don't, I, I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've been to Egypt uh, with the DOD, so I definitely know even me being there as a, as a, as a male, there are definitely cultural differences, without doubt. Um, Bridget, Sarah, who'd ever like to go next? Um, I, I guess my, my only one that I can speak of was when I was in Afghanistan as the female um, CASF commander. If there, we, you know, we had some um, local Afghani children that we were taken care of and trying to help get into an ambulance and air evac to um, other nations for more care than we could give where we were. And um, this was the country of Jordan where we were bringing this um, to the airplane, this one particular Afghani young boy. And um, there was an army sergeant that was male and he happened to be Hispanic. And then there was a female redheaded white, very white American sergeant that worked for me driving the ambulance. And, you know, I got out of the, the, amb the ambulance to talk with the Afghani um, um, elder and he did not want to have anything to do with me. He was like, you know, you're, it's a woman. And he kept talking to the male army sergeant and he's like, I don't own this ambulance, she does. You need to talk to her. And he just kept talking to him and I just smiled and waited and finally, you know, he finally acknowledged and we spoke through interpreters. Um, but I, you know, I, it, that was something that I was kind of used to seeing and, and, and just kind of got, got over it um, because I just, I would just ignore it and just keep doing my job. Um, there, a uh, funny, I visited Taiwan, um, on a team once, um, where we just like engaged with the Taiwanese Marines and, um, it was just such a foreign concept for them to see a, uh, female Marine. Um, we also had a, um, very 
tall black male sergeant and he also like that we were just like the popular people it, it was actually really funny but there was one time where I um I, people would just come up and hug me uh, and take pictures with me. And it, I wasn't in uniform. I like, they just knew who I was because like these are, this is the American team. And I just, I had to just get over the fact that I don't like hugging strangers just to not offend anyone. But it was a, it was just a pretty funny story. But um, the, the female Taiwanese Marines had a lot of questions and I, felt honored that I could answer them. Like down to what do women do in the field during their time of the month? How do we handle that? How do we, no, nobody teaches that. I learned that in boot camp, and after that, I have to figure it out on my own. And, um, or if I'm lucky, I have a female sergeant who can walk me through it. Um, these women didn't have anybody. They had male drill instructors. So it was nice to like be able to share some like cross-cultural knowledge about just what's this like being a female in you know, hard situations out in the field or on deployments and stuff. Um, so. I mean, that, that's what came to mind um, when, yeah, when you asked that question. Well, that's all the time that we have. And I would like to, first of all, begin by thanking you all for your service and being part of tonight's program. I'd like to remind everyone to visit the Women in Uniform on display until May 6th. Uh, this is an exhibit that comes directly to us from the Naval History and Heritage Command from Washington, D.C. Uh, our next exhibit, something that we're very excited about, is the largest exhibit the Ford Museum has ever had in its 40-year history. And that is the Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, the exhibition, which is bringing Rome to Grand Rapids. This globally successful exhibition is an innovative and unique interpretation of Michelangelo's timeless masterpiece. Advanced tickets are available on our website. I would also like to thank the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and those who are members of Friends of Ford who make programs, these wonderful programs like tonight, possible. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Thank you all to our panel. And thank you and have a pleasant evening.